today, I gave up. I have poured through book after book of morality, but no matter how hard I try, I always end up being a miserable moral failure. The light in the darkness still eludes me. But maybe I'm searching in the wrong place. If futilely striving to be a good person only leads to uncertainty and misery, maybe being good isn't the solution. After all, what has being good ever done for me? Greetings everyone and welcome back to the Dungeon Inn. I am the Innkeeper. A couple of weeks ago I put out a video examining normative ethical philosophy and its relationship to the alignment system, and I expected the video to be met with a resounding... Eh. But what actually happened was the opposite. You guys really resonated with a lot of the ideas I was putting out there, and in the comments of both YouTube and Reddit, decided to start having your own discussions about just how far this idea could be taken. In particular, you guys wanted to know what philosophical theories could be applied to the neutral and evil alignments. And when I made the first video, I didn't really consider the neutral or evil alignments as having much substance, or at least not enough substance, to do an entire video on. But as I was reading through your comments, I realised there is actually a really interesting discussion to be had about the neutral alignment. Alignments. Evil alignment still not so much, but we'll get to that. Granted, for some of the theories, we are going to be moving away from strict moral philosophy and into political philosophy, but I actually think that makes the discussion more interesting because we're dealing with a wider berth of ideas. And don't worry, the meta-ethics video is still coming. I'm going to do that as my third video in this series in order to top all this off, but I just thought I'd put this one here now because you guys wanted it and because meta-ethics is killing my brain. Today, we are dealing with double the amount of alignments and over double the amount of theories as last time. So, without further ado, let's get started. The bulk of this video is going to be focusing on the neutral alignments because that's where all the really juicy discussion lies. Evil moral theories are, well, evil. And that means they obey the definitions of good and evil that we set out in the first video. However, the neutral moral theories are trying to be moral without any reference to ideals of good and evil. Because of this, I think it's pertinent to give ourselves some clear definitions of law and chaos, just like we did good and evil. Law implies honour, trustworthiness, obedience to authority, and reliability. On the downside, lawfulness can include closed-mindedness, reactionary adherence to tradition, judgmentalness, and a lack of adaptability. Chaos implies freedom, adaptability, and flexibility. On the downside, chaos can include recklessness, resentment towards legitimate authority, arbitrary actions, and irresponsibility. Another way of looking at law and chaos is it reflects how your character reacts to the society around them. A lawful character acknowledges that rules and order is what is important, and therefore the society is greater than the individual. But a chaotic character believes that nothing is more important than the individual, and thus they are more important than the society that they exist in. Each alignment on the alignment chart reflects which of these four ideas, or combination thereof, have inherent moral value. But what does it mean for something to have moral weight? It means that thing has bearing on whether or not an action is moral. So, because neutral theories don't factor good and evil into their moral equations, it means there must be some way of being moral without being good. The solution is that neutral moral theories divorce what is good from what is right. A paladin can perform a good and altruistic action, but that doesn't make that action right. Likewise, a devil can perform an evil and morally corrupt action, but that doesn't make that action wrong. Our definitions of law and chaos don't just change how we understand our principal definition of good, they become our definition of morality. And to explore this, we need to look at moral obligations. A good moral theory believes that altruism or helping other people has inherent moral value. This means it is morally obligatory to help others whenever possible. So by accepting the quest and helping the poor villager, even though you aren't going to get any reward from it, you are fulfilling your moral obligation and thus are doing the right thing. And by not helping the villager, you are neglecting your moral obligation and thus doing the wrong thing. But a neutral moral theory may believe that, for example, your own individualistic self-interest is the only thing that has moral value, and thus your only moral obligation is to yourself. Under those circumstances, it is not right to help the villager, because you don't have a moral obligation towards him. In fact, you could go so far as to say that it would be wrong to help the villager if it was detrimental to your own self-interests. And if this seems off to you, that's for a logical reason. It's because of foundational beliefs. All moral theories start from a set of foundational beliefs. That God exists and he is good, or that we should try and maximise happiness wherever possible. 
Our good aligned moral theories are good because their foundational beliefs coincide with our principal definition of good. And our neutral moral theories are neutral because their foundational beliefs disagree with or are ambivalent to our principal definition of good. We as people also have foundational moral beliefs that we have developed over the course of our lives. I think it's fair to say that for most of us, our foundational beliefs are based on some part or all of our principal definition of good. Which means that when we are dealing with theories that reject that definition, a lot of their conclusions are going to seem off to people. So when I say that something about a moral theory feels intuitively wrong, it is because some part of the theory and its conclusions are clashing with my foundational moral beliefs. I actually think it's a bit misleading to use the term moral here, because as we established in the last video, D&D has an objective morality. Which means that because these theories disagree with that definition, they are strictly wrong. They are immoral. Even if someone who practices a neutral moral theory believes that they are acting justly and morally, they're not. Which isn't to say you can't have neutral characters in D&D, of course. It's just saying that those characters need to either fundamentally disagree with the multiverse itself or acknowledge that what they are doing is immoral. Or just not be smart enough to tell the difference. And like last time, I'm going to emphasize that just because you are playing a character of one of these alignments, it doesn't mean that you need to obey any of these moral theories. I'm just saying that these are ways of interpreting uh, in a more rigid, codified, philosophical sense, the ideas that are embodied by the alignments. Also, especially for this video, because I'm dealing with so many moral theories, I implore you guys, please look these theories up on your own because I am doing a very scant gloss over for a lot of these huge topics just in order to cram them into the size of this video. The Lawful Neutral Alignment believes that the only ideas that have value, moral or otherwise, are law and order. So the main question facing the Lawful Neutral Alignment is how do we come up with our moral laws? This was easy with deontology because we had our definition of good to work from. We could just look at what's good and make laws that are based around that. But in the absence of that, we need to have some way to create laws that are their own justification. One way of doing this was proposed by the 17th century philosopher Thomas Hobbes, who came up with a political and moral theory known as contractarianism or social contract theory. Contractarianism states that as a society, the only way we can function is by making deals or contracts with each other, and that the only morally wrong actions are those that break our freely and rationally entered into contracts. At its most basic level, a contract is just an agreement between two people. So say for example, I agree to lend you my copy of The Player's Handbook with the understanding that once you're done with it, you'll give it back to me. But after a couple of weeks, I haven't heard from you, so I message you asking for it back and you ghost me. Your action isn't morally wrong because you are stealing from me and stealing is bad, it's morally wrong because you broke the terms of the contracts that you agreed to. Morality is entirely determined by the laws and contracts that we create. And this idea isn't just applied to transactions between two people either, it can also be between an individual and an establishment or even an individual and a state. When you go out to a restaurant, by entering into that restaurant and dining there, you are entering into an explicit contract with a restaurant, whereby they will provide you with a nice dining experience and food, and in return, you will pay them for their services and behave appropriately. If either of you break the terms of that contract, then you are behaving immorally. Hobbes believes that because people will always act in their own self-interests, they will only enter into contracts that are beneficial for them. And because both parties are self-interested and will only enter into contracts that are beneficial for them, that contract will be mutually beneficial. Thus, a rational person will never enter into a contract that they gain no benefit from. But we could also enter into contracts that we didn't explicitly agree to, known as implicit contracts. For example, I never signed a piece of paper that said, I'm not going to murder anyone, but yet I'm expected not to murder people, and if I do, the police are going to take me, put me on trial, and throw me in jail. And that's fucking unfair. I never agreed to this. I have rights. But that's the thing, you kind of don't. You enter into these implicit contracts with your society just by being a part of it. And Hobbes justifies this by saying you get a whole bunch of benefits from being a part of a society. Namely, people aren't going to murder you. Hobbes says that these contracts are a necessary part of any society, and that without them, we would return to what is known as the state of nature. In the state of nature, there are no rules. It is a barbaric, cutthroat, miserable world where no one works together and everyone is unhappy. And laws and order, contracts, prevent us from this dark fate. And if that sounds familiar to you, it's because Hobbes' ideas have influenced a lot of science fiction and fantasy over the past couple of centuries with this idea of law versus chaos. And for a good four centuries now, Hobbes' theory of contractarianism has been influential and even convincing for a lot of people. 
If you don't like the society that you're a part of, you could fuck right off back to Russia, you commie. But that doesn't mean that contractarianism doesn't have its critics. In particular, they question the nature of implicit contracts and whether or not they are actually valid. Say for example, you were an elf and you were in a society that hates elves. And yes, elves are going to continue to be the whipping boys for all of my examples because they need to be brought down a peg, the pretentious pointy eared pricks. The elf is discriminated against, can't own land, and isn't afforded the same protections as the ordinary citizens of the society. And a contractarian would say the elf is agreeing to those terms by being a part of the society, and if they don't like those terms, they can just leave. But is that actually feasible for an elf? If all that lies beyond the city is wilderness, then the elf doesn't really have another choice. Or if every society has these laws, then again, they don't have a choice. The elf is still acting in their best interests by staying within the society, which means they are agreeing to being treated like a lower class citizen. And because morality is purely based on the contracts we make with each other, there is nothing morally wrong with that. And if this feels wrong, it's probably because your foundational beliefs disagree with this. You probably believe it is never okay to treat a certain race or group of people as subpar citizens. But that is because your foundational beliefs are based on a definition of good and evil. And contractarianism as a lawful neutral theory doesn't care about that. Another criticism against contractarianism is that Hobbes says individuals will enter into contracts because it is in their own self-interest. So self-interest is the motivator to be moral. But what if it is in your self-interest to avoid contracts? Or make contracts and then just not adhere to them because that benefits you? If self-interest is the end goal here, there's nothing wrong with that. Hobbes' reply to this is that people will do the right thing because they don't want to bring down the ire of society. But what if you don't care what other people think of you? Or if you can get away with it without anyone else knowing? Then there's no real obligation here because the true obligation is to yourself. Contracts by their nature take away some of your rights, but if you've got the ability to fulfill your end of the contract but still retain your rights and no one finds out about it, then you've got no reason to not do that. Contractarianism falls short because it can't give us an adequate replacement for our definition of good. But then again, you know, our moral theories that do have our definition of good still, you know, have problems, so I wouldn't blame you for trying to be a contractarian and fix it up a little bit. Nihilism. Okay, but seriously, apart from the mess that is objectivism, true neutral was the hardest of any of the alignments to come up with moral theories for, because if it's hard to come up with moral theories for the neutral alignments because they lack one half of the alignment chart, true neutral lacks both halves. A true neutral character doesn't value anything, be it good, evil, law, or chaos. How can you make a moral theory out of that? And for ages, I struggled with this while I was writing the script, and then it hit me. And then it hit me again, because there's actually two theories, I believe, that are true neutral. The first is Buddhism, and Buddhism believes that we should all be striving towards the state of Nirvana. A state where you have severed yourself from your earthly desires and persist in pure, contented peace. Not happy, not unhappy, just content. And if that isn't neutral, I don't know what is. Buddhism is based on four principles known as the Four Noble Truths, the first of which is suffering. That is to say that suffering is an inherent part of life and there is nothing we can do about that. Wow, how perceptive of you. Secondly, that suffering is caused by the greed, ignorance and hatred within our own minds. It is us wishing that things would be different to the way that they actually are that causes us pain. Thirdly, because suffering and unhappiness comes from our desires, we need to sever ourselves from our earthly tether and reach a state known as Nirvana, in which we become purely contented and compassionate beings. The fourth noble truth is known as the Eightfold Path, which is how the Buddha believes we go about attaining Nirvana. Now, there is a lot more to Buddhism than just the Four Noble Truths, for example, the concept of karma and reincarnation, but I'm not going to go into it here, but I'm sure I will in another future video where I talk about monks and how nobody ever fucking plays them right. It is important to note that while an enlightened monk or a monk that has reached Nirvana uh, does have compassion, they do not have empathy, because empathy puts you in the shoes of the creature that is in pain, uh, and you feel pain for them, you feel suffering, and you wish that things were another way, which is a an earthly desire and something they have moved past. You could potentially make the argument that Buddhism is neutral good, but in my mind, because the ultimate goal that you are working towards with Buddhism is your own self-enlightenment and you are being compassionate only because that is a part of the process of getting to that enlightenment, trying to be a good person for selfish reasons. Selfish, not to the detriment of others though, so neutral. 
Buddhism is also neither lawful nor chaotic, because yes, while Buddhist monks obey the Eightfold Path and other strict laws, uh, they have no real attachment to those laws. If there was a way to reach enlightenment without obeying those laws, in a heartbeat they would jump over to that other form. But while Buddhism does focus on the individual and their path to enlightenment, I wouldn't say it's so attached to the notion of individuality that it is a chaotic theory either. And then plus they actually obey the aforementioned laws, which I don't think a chaotic theory would do. So hence it is neither good nor evil, nor lawful nor chaotic, true neutral. Bang. Done. The second true neutral theory, however, is going to be a bit more controversial and a lot more sexy. Hedonism. The belief that the only two things that have intrinsic value in this world are pleasure and pain. And thus you should live in a way that maximizes the amount of pleasure and minimize the amount of pain that you experience. But we all know that those two things aren't necessarily exclusive. I actually wanted to do a few more scene changes like this so that way the video is a little more visually interesting to offset the dense nature of the subject matter. But um, then this whole isolation thing happened and I lost access to most of my shooting sites and well, uh, this is just what I had lying around. Oh, you thought these were props? If only you knew. Hedonism tends to get a bad rap. When people think of a hedonist, they tend to think of a Jordan Belfort or a Don Juan, someone who pursues pleasure to the detriment of everyone and everything else in their lives. But hedonism actually has a long and storied history that dates all the way back to ancient Egypt. The idea of a hedonist as the indulgent Casanova stems from the philosopher Jeremy Bentham, who believed that all pleasures were equal and thus you should just pursue whichever pleasure lasts the longest and is the most intense. And this was famously criticised in his day for being a doctrine of swine. Ooh, I've been called a lot of things in my time, but never a swine. This is because logically, if all pleasures were equal, then the life of a satisfied pig would be more valuable than the life of an average human. But most people don't tend to think that. They tend to think that the life of even just a average human is more valuable than the pig which means there must be something higher or more valuable that's part of the human experience of pleasure. And just like his theory of utilitarianism, our daddy John Stuart Mill decided that he was going to update and improve upon his tutor's teachings. He clarified all pleasures into either lower or higher. Lower pleasures were basal pleasures like sex, drugs and rock and roll, while higher pleasures were something like reading a good book or winning an argument. But Johnny, Johnny, Johnny. I'm a philosopher and I enjoy a bout of the rigorous intellectual debates as much as the next person. But does it really feel that much better than getting your sucked or your licked? Okay, well, maybe winning an argument does, but... But the question of the day is, how is hedonism true neutral? Well, it's certainly not good because altruism is only valuable insofar as it brings the hedonist pleasure. If you ever sacrifice your own pleasure in order to even bring other people pleasure, you have departed from hedonism and have moved into Bentham's utilitarianism. So hedonism is inherently selfish, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's evil. As I said before, people often make the mistake of believing that hedonism is seeking pleasure to the detriment of others, but a true hedonist allows other people to pursue their own pleasure in their own time. Hedonism is also neither lawful nor chaotic, because while the hedonist will most likely obey most laws, because obeying the laws is the path of least resistance and will cause them the least pain, they won't obey those laws if they believe that disobeying the laws will bring them more pleasure and less pain. But at the same time, they're likely not about to throw themselves into a revolution. Their individuality is only important to them insofar as it brings them pleasure. Everything comes back to pleasure. They hold nothing else in high esteem. And pleasure is a true neutral idea. It's not good, it's not evil, it's not lawful, it's not chaotic. Hence hedonism is true neutral. On the opposite side of the scale to lawful neutral, we have lawful chaotic. No, that's not right. On the opposite side of the scale to lawful neutral, we have chaotic neutral, which Unlike what some people may think is not the alignment of total randomness and unpredictability, chaotic neutral simply believes that the radical freedom of the individual is right in and of itself and has moral value above all else. And to me, when I think of the epitome of chaos and individuality, it seems to me that anarchism is the only logical conclusion, right? So let me tell you why it's not. 
Anarchism is a huge topic and its key thinkers have a lot of different theories about how to go about its guiding principle. That being that states have a disproportionate amount of power over their subjects and use that power to restrict their all important radical freedom. The state decides what is moral and what is not through legislature and enforcement and uses those means to ensure obedience whether or not the individual agrees with the state's moral decisions. Anarchism doesn't mean that you don't have a moral code, it means that you have a moral code, but that moral code is different to the one that your society has and you refuse them to be beholden to their expectations. My issue with fitting anarchism into the alignment chart is that I see it as purely a political theory, not a moral one. Anarchism doesn't tell you what is right or wrong beyond the fact that states shouldn't oppress your radical freedom. It relies on you using your own moral code, which it doesn't at all dictate, to decide whether or not you agree with what the state is doing. The most common form of moral anarchism is the kind that seeks to topple unjust hierarchies. The problem with it is that what constitutes an unjust hierarchy is subjective, and most often it draws on other ideas like you should always respect the dignity of other sentient beings which is a good definition. It's bringing in external values to the anarchist definition, which makes it a chaotic good theory, not neutral. Not to mention, you could be a lawful good paladin and potentially labeled as an anarchist. If you were in that city that hates elves and you were trying to stand up for elvish rights, then the society could label you as an anarchist, despite the fact you are incredibly lawful. Likewise, you could have a chaotic evil anarchist who just wants to literally reduce everything back to Hobbes' state of nature, where everything is just destruction. Anarchism flies all over the alignment chart because it doesn't have a coherent moral center to ground its rebellious ideas on. And that's why I believe it doesn't actually belong on the alignment chart. Okay, but so the question remains, what is a chaotic neutral moral theory? Objectivism is a very divisive political theory and I implore you all to put down your pitchforks and let me explain my position on this. Objectivism is a moral theory created just last century by the American Russian philosopher Ayn Rand. Objectivism starts from the premise that the world is objective to us, we cannot change the way it is, and the only thing we have rational control over is ourselves. Ethics, then, is designed to provide us with individual guidance, as we cannot control the actions of other people. Because our being and choices are the only things we have rational control over, the only thing that has moral value is our individuality. To that end, objectivism argues that we as individuals need to live for our own sakes and not for the sake of anyone else. But what makes objectivism so divisive is that it argues that selfishness is good. In fact, not only that selfishness is good, but selfishness is the only good. The only way to live a good life is living in your own self-interest, because your individuality is the only thing that has value. To make matters worse, objectivism comes outright and condemns altruism. To the objectivist, altruism is the greatest evil that can exist, because by being altruistic, you are living for other people instead of yourself. Ergo, you are robbing yourself of your individuality, the only thing that has value. I repeat, objectivism says that altruism is evil. To Rand, living an altruistic life means that self-sacrifice is the highest moral duty you can perform. And to live a truly altruistic life, you always need to be living for other people, and your own individuality comes last. Which, I mean, isn't entirely wrong. One of the criticisms of the utilitarian doctrine that I didn't touch on in the last video is that a true utilitarian has the risk of becoming what is known as a happiness pump, in that they are so focused on just creating the most amount of happiness in the world for other people that they can never justify taking any little pleasures for themselves, and thus they end up just unhappy, and that's no way to live a life. And to Rand's philosophy, which puts your individuality as paramount and singular importance, that really is the greatest evil that can exist. And if it wasn't enough to advocate for selfishness and condemn altruism, then Rand's theory of objectivism is often formulated into four rings. At its center is reality, the ring beyond that is reason, the ring beyond that is self-interest, and the ring beyond that, the final ring, the final conclusion uh, and result of Rand's objectivist philosophy is capitalism. And we all know that capitalism is the greatest evil that has existed and the result of all of the evil that currently exists in the world and this theory is trash and it needs to be thrown in the trash and it is evil. But now you're probably thinking, Drew, if objectivism is so evil, then why on earth did you put it as a neutral moral theory? 
I don't fucking know. I'm honestly not convinced that this theory is neutral. It's certainly not good because it condemns altruism, but uh, look, let's look at our definitions of good and evil. Evil implies harming, oppressing, and killing others. Some evil creatures may have no compassion for others and kill without qualms if doing so is convenience or if it can be set up. Others actively pursue evil, killing for sport or out of some duty to some malevolent deity or master. But see, Rand's definition doesn't go that far. In fact, it advocates that you should let other people pursue their own self-interest in their own time and you shouldn't impede them in doing that because that is you impeding on their own personal radical freedom. And that all sounds very neutral. So where does that leave us? And here is where I need to draw a distinction between Anne's idealized form of objectivism and capitalism and the form of realistic capitalism that we are currently living. Anne's form of capitalism had a very strict distinction between economics and the state, similar to the church and the state, but honestly, even in the real world, we fail with that. But that is clearly not the form of capitalism that we find ourselves in today and the kind of capitalism that has fucked over our world and we are now having to desperately put the pieces back together with. Capitalism has only flourished over the past few centuries because it has been built on the backs of abuses of human rights, slave labor forces. Even to this day, it is underpinned by exploitative practices in developing countries. So whether or not you think objectivism is neutral or evil depends on whether or not you think, even in theory, capitalism can function without those abuses of human rights. Many, I'm sure, can't. I am choosing tepidly to be charitable towards Anne's objectivism and say that yes, her theory of capitalism, should it actually come to fruition, would be neutral. Because in theory, it is. The practicality of whether or not that can actually exist is something that is subject to heavy debate. The evil theories are much easier to talk about than the neutral ones because we are once again working with two values instead of one, but that also makes them much less interesting. The evil alignments are mostly just perverted, corrupted forms of the other theories we've already talked about. A lawful evil character is someone who uses rules and order in order to subjugate and harm others. The epitome of lawful evil in D&D are devils, who are basically just contractarians who intentionally leave misleading and exploitative text in their contracts in order to steal mortal souls. Another common one is the corrupt priest, or someone who uses natural law theory, which we haven't really talked about, so I'll give it a brief overview here. Natural law theory is basically like, God exists and he says that these are the natural laws of the world, so we kind of need to go along with that. It's like an offshoot of divine command theory. And so a lawful evil character would use the evidence of natural law to justify uh, abusing, oppressing, and discriminating against uh, certain peoples. It's Frollo from The Hunchback of Notre Dame, or that fucking priest from season one of Castlevania, who I can't even remember the name of. But if we're talking about a single theory that epitomizes lawful evil, I don't think we can get much more evil and lawful than totalitarianism slash fascism. Totalitarianism is a system of government whereby the state controls absolutely everything about how our country runs. Not just the government, they control the church, they control the economics, they control every aspect of their citizens' lives, and as a part of that, it necessarily comes with the oppression and suppression of freedom and information. Fascism is the even worse form of that, where the state actually uses its power to specifically target and oppress certain minorities and groups of people. And I don't really think I need to make an argument for why that's lawful evil. They believe that laws are good because laws allow them the power to oppress a whole bunch of people for their evil goals, and that gives them power. And I don't really think there's much more to say on that. Um, totalitarianism is bad. Let's not do it, guys. Please, let's not do it. I honestly don't have a theory for chaotic evil. I know, right? Like, I do this whole video intending to give a theory to all the alignments, but I just, for the life of me, I can't come up with one. Chaotic evil is individuality uh, and greed and destructiveness. Uh, all bundled up together. I don't think it always has to be like the demons level of, oh, I just want to destroy because it's in my nature uh, and chaos is everything. I want to harm everything and bring everything back to the state of nature. I don't think it's always that, um, but I don't think there's a specific theory that advocates for uh, both chaos, individuality, and evil. Like what kind of fucking moral theory would do that? I'm sorry guys, I just 
can't think of one. If you guys can think of one, drop it in the comments down below because I'd be interested to hear it. Maybe there's something really obvious that I'm just overlooking. Of course, if you think that objectivism is actually evil, that would certainly be an example of a chaotic evil moral theory. And for a while, I was tempted to keep it down here just so I had something down here. And in that case, I would move hedonism probably over to chaotic, but it really fits better into the neutral category and it really there. So look, this is what we're going with. Finally, we get to the last alignment of them all, the final moral theory of this series. Neutral evil is the alignment of pure, unadulterated evil. A neutral evil character doesn't care about obeying the laws or using some pre-existing power structure in order to enact their evil deeds, nor do they believe that their individuality and that radical freedom is of huge importance. They will be willing to sacrifice their freedom if it means it nets them more power. Neutral evil is power for power's sake. Nikolai Machiavelli's work The Prince was published in 1532 and was a treatise on nobles on how to rule, by which he means how to gain power and how to keep it. As established when we talked about anarchism, power is the ability to restrict other people's actions, and so Machiavelli was essentially telling the royalty of Italy how to be the biggest dicks they could possibly be. In The Prince, Machiavelli explains how nobles need to, in order to gain and maintain power, be ruthless, uncompromising, and in all honesty, evil. He dedicates large parts of the book to talking about how good Christian ideals are incompatible with being a good ruler, and how that kindness will always be exploited by those without any moral scruples. But Machiavelli's ideas have been applied to more than just rulership in the centuries since. Now, to be a Machiavellian character, you just need to be willing to pursue power at all costs and do whatever you need to in order to attain it. If that means obeying laws uh, under an unjust hierarchy or a just hierarchy, just so you can stab people in the back later and go back on your word, then that is what you need to do. If you need to give up some of your own personal freedoms in order to ingratiate yourself into a pre-existing power structure, then you do that. You do whatever you need to do in order to gain power. A Machiavellian character is untrustworthy, merciless, and selfish above all else. Machiavelli does say, in an ideal world, it wouldn't be like this. But we're not in an ideal world. The world is shit, and people are shit. And the only way to survive and gain power in a world where people are shit, is to be even more shit of a person yourself. That's how you not only survive, but thrive. And there we have it, that is all nine alignments on the D&D alignment chart and their corresponding philosophical theories. Hopefully you found these videos interesting and it gave you a um, perhaps different perspective on the alignments and give you some ideas on how you can apply them uh, at your table. And even if it didn't and you strongly disagree with some of the things I said in this video, I disagree where I've put theories or with my interpretation of the alignments, then you know what? Thanks for watching anyway. If you agree with me and like the video, also let me know. Um, like the video, subscribe if you want to see more content like this. Next time we have the penultimate philosophy in D&D video. If you guys think these past two videos were complicated and hard to get your head around, oh. Oh. and like last time, if you guys are interested or want to question me on anything that I said in this video, uh, you can do that in the comments as well. All of your support is greatly appreciated, and if you want me to be putting out more content like this and show me that you really support it, uh, then you can actually hit me up on Patreon, and for only a couple of dollars a month, you guys can see uh, scripts for these videos before they actually go out, so you can help be a part of my uh, proof, uh, proofreading and proof testing crew. So, uh, that is all for today. This video is already long enough. Uh, thank you very much for watching this video, and I hope you enjoyed your stay here at the Dungeon Inn.